Okay, the next charge distribution for us to look at when calculating the electric field due to that distribution is the ring of charge. So imagine taking a wire, for example, connecting the two ends like so, so it forms a ring. And then it's still gonna be a one-dimensional wire. So then therefore we're gonna ignore the thickness of the wire. It has once again a linear charge density, charge per length. And then along an axis, passing through the geometrical center of the ring, perpendicular to it, we're gonna go ahead and then calculate the electric field at some point in space, some distance away from the ring. A little bit later on in the problem, we'll also see what happens if you get really far from the ring or if you get really close to the ring. But for now, let's go ahead and go through the brute force calculation. So I've got this written out as a problem. Let's go ahead and access it here, copy it down into your notes. Okay, so a linear ring of charge of uniform charge density has a total charge plus capital Q and a radius A. So it is a finite sized object. So for that reason, it does have a total charge referred to as plus capital Q. Okay, find the electric field at a point of distance Z away from the origin along an axis perpendicular to the ring that passes through the center of the ring. So here's then what we need to describe. Okay, so let me begin by going ahead and drawing out a coordinate axis like so. I'll go ahead and take the ring and place it in the XY plane like so. It has a total charge plus capital Q associated with it and a radius small a. Okay, right here along the z-axis is once again my point P. It's a distance z away from the ring. And then the first thing that we have to do, of course, is draw out all of our position vectors. Okay, so let's say that right here is an infinitesimally small amount of charge, dQ prime. There's an infinitesimally small length associated with it. It's an arc length, by the way, on this circle. We'll refer to it as dS. Okay, right here on the diagram, this right here is the little r prime vector. And let's go ahead and break it into components. There's a component there that's right here along the x-axis and a component right here along the y-axis. We're in the xy plane. Let's go ahead and define here an angle theta. The magnitude here of this vector, little r prime, is just the radius of the ring A. Okay, now let's go ahead and write out the r prime vector. So r prime is going to equal A cosine theta i hat, that's this component here, plus then A sine theta j hat. Like so. Okay, and then we've got our point P in space. So right here is the little r vector. The little r vector is just going to be a zk hat, just like it was in the infinite line of charge calculation in the previous lecture. Okay, and then capital R is right here on the diagram, like so. The magnitude of capital R, you'll notice, is just the hypotenuse of a right triangle. Right here is the right angle associated with that triangle. Okay, now let's go ahead and write out capital R. It's R minus R prime. So then therefore it's a zk hat minus this quantity right here. Equals zk hat minus this. Like so. Okay, now the side of this this side rather of the triangle is A. This side of the triangle here is Z. So if we just use a Pythagorean theorem, we can then find the magnitude of capital R. So the magnitude of capital R is z squared plus a squared to the one-half power. Okay, now I start to have everything that I need here in order to begin to write out Coulomb's Law. Okay, before we do, here is, in general, what Coulomb's Law, if you recall, looks like. Like so. But there's still one thing that we need before I start filling in the terms there, and that's, of course, dq prime, the infinitesimally small amount of charge. This is where the charge density lambda comes into play once again. Recall that linear charge density is charge per length. So then therefore the charge is equal to the density multiplied by the length. Okay, now this right here, ds, is the arc length on a circle. If you recall, this right here is the length element in polar coordinates. Recall what the length element in polar coordinates looks like. Okay, so take that little ds there that's on the board above, and now let's just look at the xy plane, <coughs> like so. All right, so here's the xy plane. Here's the ds, like so, on the diagram above. Okay, it's distance away from the center of the ring is equal to the radius of the ring a. 
then right here is an infinitesimally small angle d theta that's being subtended. So recall that arc length divided by radius is equal to angle, so then therefore the arc length is equal to the radius times the angle. So if I jump back up to the top board, this then means that dq prime is lambda a d theta, like so. Okay, now I've got everything I need. Now we plug everything into the expression. So let's go ahead and erase this. Okay, so writing out my integral now, I first of all have k times dq prime, so k lambda a d theta, okay, then multiply by capital R vector, which is z k hat minus a cosine theta i hat minus a sine theta j hat, and then all divided by capital R, the magnitude of it, cubed. So that's going to be a z squared plus a squared to the 3 halves power. Like so. Okay. okay, now what is the variable that we're integrating over? It's the angle theta. So then therefore we have to go all the way around the ring. This then means that our limits are from 0 to 2 pi. Like so. Okay, now take a look at the x component of the integral and the y component of the integral. At point P, due to the symmetry of the ring, we should find that the X component of the overall net electric field at point P and the Y component at point P, they should all just cancel out to zero. So let's see if that's the case. So let's take a look at the I hat integral, and really the only thing that we have to worry about is the integral from zero to two pi of cosine of theta d theta. Everything else here is a constant except for the trig terms. So the I hat integral is just gonna be the following integral from 0 to 2 pi of cosine of theta d theta. So integral of cosine is sine, and then we're integrating from 0 to 2 pi. Sine of 2 pi is 0, sine of 0 is 0, therefore the i hat integral is equal to 0. Okay, now same thing for the j hat integral. For the j hat integral, all that we have to worry about is the integral from, integral from 0 to 2 pi of sine of theta d theta. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so integral of sine is negative cosine. Okay, let's go ahead and plug in the limits. So I'm gonna have here negative cosine of two pi first, so that's negative one, minus then negative cosine of zero, so minus and negative one. This then adds up to zero. So ultimately then, due to symmetry, both the x component and the y component of the net electric field at point P is equal to zero. So then therefore, what does this do to the expression here above? Well, it simplifies it considerably. Yeah, I'm just gonna do some erasing here, but you probably wanna rewrite it in your notes. Ultimately then, the integral that we have to set up and evaluate is this integral here. Let me go ahead and put the d theta here outside like so. So we've shown that the i hat portion and the j hat portion of the integral are both zero. Therefore, we only have to worry about the k hat direction or the z direction. Okay, now what do I do with integrating? Well, all that I have here is integral of zero to two pi t theta, and that's it. There are no other trig terms here that are present in the integrand. Ultimately, everything there is a constant. So then therefore, if I integrate from zero to two pi of d theta, you just end up with two pi. Okay, so then let's go ahead and write the answer. So 2 pi times k times lambda times a times z times k hat all divided by here z squared plus a squared to the 3 halves, like so. We do, however, have to write the answer in terms of the variables that were given. The linear charge density lambda was not given in the problem. Instead, the total charge, capital Q, and the radius A were given. So then therefore, let's go ahead and write the linear charge density lambda as charge per length, like so, where the length, of course, is the circumference of the ring, 2 pi A. So let's go ahead and fill that in into the expression. So the electric field then is equal to the following. Okay, first of all, 2 pi K, 2 pi K, excuse me, so, and then now multiply by lambda. So Q over 2 pi A, and then times A times Z, K hat, 
all divided by z squared plus a squared to the 3 halves power. Okay, let's go ahead and simplify. 2 pi, 2 pi cancels, a, a cancels, like so. And then what I'm left with is the following. K, Q, Z, K hat, divided by here, my denominator. So, and that there is ultimately the answer. Okay, now you do have to be familiar with the overall shape of the electric fluid field due to the ring of charge. All that we have done is we have found that the electric field at point P on the diagram above is in the positive Z direction and it has this as its magnitude. However, if we were to do this type of calculation at all points in space around the ring, it would be a very difficult calculation, by the way. You would en end up with the overall shape of the electric field due to the ring of charge. Okay, it looks something like this. Okay, so right here is my green ring. Like so, it's positively charged. So then therefore, I'm gonna draw the electric field lines away from that positive charge. So first of all, along the axis itself, it looks like so. But then if you start to move away from the axis, it kind of flares out in these directions like so. Like this. And then ultimately you end up with something that is symmetrical above and below the ring. But setting up and running through this brute force calculation that is setting up this integral for points that are off of the axis is actually quite difficult to do. Okay, now there's a couple of other things to look at here in this problem. Let me move my file down to do so. Okay, using this expression right here, that is the electric field at point P as we've already calculated, now we're going to see how this behaves for different distances from the ring. So at the bottom of the problem, it says, what happens if Z is much greater than A, the radius of the ring? So in other words, you're really far from the ring. So what happens if Z is much, much greater than A? All right, well, if that's the case, if z is much greater than a here in the denominator of the expression, then inside the parentheses, all that you have is basically just z squared. So I have here z squared. We'll ignore the a now. It's infinitesimally small. So I now have z squared, and we take the square root of it, which is z, and then we cube it, which is z cubed. And then I have a z over z cubed, which is a 1 over z squared. This thing gives us the following as the electric field. K times Q times K hat, and then divided by Z squared. Notice that this is the electric field due to a point charge. That makes sense. If you get far enough away from the ring, the ring is infinitesimally small. It just looks like a point charge. Okay, that's not all that surprising. And now let's see what happens if z is much less than a. So now in this case, we get really close to the ring along the axis. And then what we do is we place an electron there, which is negatively charged. What happens if we do? Okay, well, let's see. Okay, so now let's first of all ask and answer the question, what happens if a, the radius of the ring, is much, much greater than z. Well, if a is now much, much greater than z, we can ignore the z here in the denominator of the expression. And then therefore I have a squared, take the square root of it, which is a, and then cube it, which is a cubed. So then therefore the electric field would be equal to the following. k, q, z, k hat, and then just divided by a squared. Notice that the electric field, its magnitude, depends upon the distance z, how far away you are from the ring. So then therefore, along the z-axis, as you get further and further from the ring, the electric field magnitude increases linearly. So now let's set up F equals ma by describing the force that's exerted upon a negatively charged electron placed at some distance z here away from the ring. So now place 
an electron at some distance z away. Okay, the symbol, by the way, for the charge of the electron is E minus. The charge of the electron itself is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. How that was ultimately determined experimentally in a very famous experiment called the Millikan experiment is another story for another time. But the charge of an electron, it's negatively charged, but the magnitude of it is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Okay, now let's go ahead and place an electron some distance z away. Okay, now to visualize this, let me write down this magnitude, by the way, before I forget it. Okay, so to visualize this, let me go ahead and draw our coordinate axis like so. Okay, right here is the ring, charge plus Q, radius A, and then right here, a distance is Z away from the ring, that right there is where we place our negatively charged electron. Okay, in which direction is the force going to be exerted upon the electron, which is negatively charged, due to the positively charged ring? Well, it's going to be in the z direction, but it's going to be downwards on my diagram, like so. So then, therefore, the electric force that's exerted upon the electron, it behaves like a restoring force. It's trying to bring the electron back to the center of the ring. At the center of the ring, by the way, when z is equal to zero, notice that the electric field is equal to zero. This behaves analogously as like an equilibrium position of a spring. Now, I'm mentioning that for a specific reason. Let's now go ahead and write F equals MA. So the force itself is gonna be the electric field here multiplied by the charge of the electron. I'm gonna give it a negative sign for reasons as you'll see in just a moment. Like so. And the reason why I am giving this a negative sign is because like the spring force, the electric force in this case is a restoring force, trying to bring the electron back to the equilibrium position. This is then equal to the mass of the electron multiplied by its acceleration. The acceleration of the electron is the second derivative of its position with respect to time. Does this differential equation look familiar? It should. It's the differential equation for simple harmonic motion. electron is a simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, the magnitude of the angular frequency of that oscillation is found in the following way. Let's go ahead and take the mass of the electron here and move it down to the denominator on the other side of the expression. So then therefore the expression becomes this. Like so. And then right here are all the constants in front of position. So recall from simple harmonic motion that the negative sign and then constants times position equals the second derivative is the differential equation for a simple harmonic oscillator. The angular frequency omega of the oscillation would then therefore be the following expression. Like so. Now in a practical sense, what we can then do is set up a situation like this, for example, and use it as a transmitter.